uh, in Talvier where I was, they had a connection to the police in Lyon. They got, they got a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning on, on 15 August and said, clear, clear the place out, they're coming to arrest everybody. So by 3 o'clock in the morning, we were on the road. Uh, I knew about Le Chambon because Le Chambon also had a Swiss Red Cross home, which I had heard about and learned about when I was working at the one and the Grand Gurs. So I decided, said, you know, I, that's where I wanted to go. I had no idea about what Le Chambon was or anything. Uh, of course, didn't have any papers or anything. Had nothing. Uh, I had a few francs enough to take a bus. Got to Le Chambon on, I guess, on the 17th or 18th of May. Took, uh, I had taken the train for, from Saint Etienne. There was a Chemin de Fer Departemental, mm -hmm. which was the CFD, which went around all the Haute mm -hmm. Loire and Ardèche and, and uh, went to Le Chambon from Saint Etienne. But actually, not Saint Etienne, from Dunière. We got there in the, the last train at night, uh, got, got the last train at night, spent the night in the woods. The next morning went and found the Swiss Red Cross place. Told them where I had been and so on. They said, okay, you, you can stay here. Mm -hmm. the, the, the people in the Chambon, it, it was an extraordinary place. Uh, it was a one of the few places in France which was mostly Protestant. Uh, Historically, there were three, three places in France which had Protestant majorities, local majorities. One was near Toulouse, one was in the Massif Central in Le Chambon and, and, and around there. Third one was uh, La Rochelle. Uh, interestingly enough, the reason for La Rochelle was because it could be su supplied by and, su and protected by the English fleet. Mm -hmm. While Le Chambon was in the mountains and was defensible. We're, we're talking, you know, 16th century. The pastor, André Trocmé and, and Edouard Thais, <coughs> had been conscientious objectors in, uh, at the beginning of World War II. And when the Vichy regime came in and started their anti-Semitic actions and refugees started coming. It was a, I think Mr. Tokme gave a speech, a, a sermon at, at the temple about what the, the what what their religion meant, and that was uh, to take care of people who were less fortunate or, or were being being hunted for for not not criminal reasons for other reasons, and the village just absolutely as as a whole agreed. Do you remember your first days? At Le Chambon, when did you arrive there? Yes. Well, uh, uh, I was, I, you know, I found I found the the, the Swiss Red Cross uh, house and talked to the director who was there, and and they said, okay, you can stay here, and I, I got a room. Uh, they found me some extra clothes and and. Uh, because I, I just what I had on, and uh, we got three meals a day. We we didn't do anything. Then shortly after that, school had started. Of course, they took us into you know the school took us in. Those of us who mm -hmm. were old enough and 
Not everybody spoke French, you know, because I came from Belgium, I spoke French. Okay. And I had no problem. So the school was it the Collège Sévignol? Le Collège Sévignol. The Collège Sévignol. It was, at the time, it, 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 there, no, there was no campus. Uh, classes were held in a variety of homes, downtown, up, up a hill. One of the classes was held in, in the city hall, in, in, in one of the rooms. Uh, we just, uh, but but the, the teachers were outstanding. And uh, I remember several of them, as my, by, even by name, which considering my memory, means they, they impressed me, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, who, who do you remember the I, most? Well, the French teachers, Madame Lavoisier, uh, the physics and chemistry teacher was Monsieur Tissot, and the uh, there were two English teachers. Now one was Mabel, one was Scottish, one was English, but they both spoke good good English, mm -hmm. and I mean you know the Scottish woman did not have a strong accent or anything mm -hmm. like that. Uh, there's one. Uh, do you recall uh, having Paul Ricoeur? <coughs> oh yes. Well, that was part. That's well. That was uh, okay. That didn't happen till uh, forty four, forty five. After I came back. After you came back. Okay. Uh, and when I was actually enrolled in, in, uh, formally uh, in order to get my first and second baccalaureate. Okay. Okay. So okay. Uh, in forty two, I was. Just taking classes, you know, okay. because I, you needed to do something. Uh, after after I you know, knew my parents had been deported, I knew my sister was relatively sa safe. I mean, she worked for this French official. I mean, she but spent the nights in the in the camp, in the camp down at Perpignan, and. You know, all of France was occupied. I went to see Monsieur Teich, and I said, I don't want to be caught here or any place. If I'm going to be caught, I want to be caught with a rifle in my hand. Therefore, I want to leave and I want to join the Free French in London. He made no effort to talk me out of it. Not only that, he said in 19, when I was, he was old enough, that by 1916, he volunteered for the French army. So he understood what I was doing. He said, you go see Madame Philippe, she'll take care of you. And so by mid-December, I had my false identity card and the story that went with it. Mid-December.